Good evening and welcome to another edition of Zeitzmacher's Warza at Home, the Slow Look series. My name is Michael Jacobs and in this month's edition, titled Threading Histories, we explore the past and contemporary of textile and dress through the artworks and practices of some of the contemporary African artists that we at Zeitzmacher have had the opportunity of working with artists such as South African contemporary artists such as Mary Sibande, Senzeni Mahasela, and Nandi Pamtambo. We also have British born Nigerian artist Yinka Shonibari, and from Benin, Leon Raphael Agbujelo. Before we continue, um, just to let you know. Please, 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 it is a conversation, so we would love to hear from you. Please feel free to make use of the chat function um, in the group, it should be below. And we just ask that we all remain um, open-minded and respectful uh, during our conversation. I'm not gonna be doing this alone though. I'm joined by amazing colleagues of mine, uh, Saki Tina and Siseko Mawe. Good evening, guys, how are you? Hi, Michael. Uh, my name is Saki Tsena. I'm part of the curatorial team at the museum. I'm happy to be part of this conversation. I want to make a disclaimer that the coat I'm wearing is fake fur, so there wasn't an animal killed in the making for this coat. And I wore it because one of the artists will speak about um, uses animal skin as material in their practice. Um, looking what kind forward. of fur is it? Or what kind of fake fur is it? It represents a snow leopard, which we don't have in South Africa. Uh, cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Siseko Mawei. I am one of your friendly gallery guys at Zeitzmoka. And let's have fun. Let's have a conversation. Let's kiki. Let's do all the good things. I think that's exactly what we're going to be doing, um, Siseko. So without uh, any further ado, let's get into it. I mean, we've got what all of the artists that we are going to be talking about tonight in some way or other engage um, textile or material in their artistic practice. And I think what's interesting to also see is how these artists use um, history or how they incorporate history into their artistic practice. Uh, one of the artists that does that amazingly is artist Mary Sibane. Um, Saki, yes, tell us a bit about that. What is, how does, how does Mary Sibane incorporate history into artistic practice? I think she does it in various ways um, through the use of uh, the textile um, itself, but also uh, color symbolism and its um, design um, in various styles. Um, and she references both a personal and collective history. I think they intersect with each other um, beautifully throughout her work. If we look at the first image, we can start to see references to various um, both um, African and colonial histories um, together with um, spiritual practices um, and monuments that have commemorated um, certain histories. Uh, mm. So um, I really like the idea of the character that is represented throughout her work, which is Sophie, um, who is a persona that represents many black women's stories um, in South Africa and under the context of apartheid um, into mm. democracy. Mm. So I know that I know. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned um, Sophie because Sophie becomes interesting in that she represents the women that have come before her in her own family, as well as the story of, of many black South African women who have um, become or who were and are domestic workers. 
Yes, exactly. Um, when we look at the style of dress um, for Sophie, we can see a, a traditionally Victorian style domestic workers uniform, uh, complete with an apron and a head wrap. Um, and I think it's important for us to acknowledge that under apartheid, a black woman did not have access to opportunities that allowed them to pursue different professions or education that would have given them the ability um, to participate um, in the economy in ways that gave them mobility and uh, progress. So um, they would What were some of the things fed- that you could become again? A domestic worker? Yes, you could uh, become a domestic worker or a nurse if you are educated or even a teacher. Um, but uh, primarily, uh, most women uh, who uh, had to live particularly in the rural areas of the country didn't have access to education that um, would give them the ability to become something else other than a domestic worker. Um, and I see the use of um, the color for the first image, the rain, um, mm. is uh, uh, this blue indigo, uh, which is typically associated with um, so-called blue collar working class, uh, mm. where people are engaged in manual forms of labor, um, mm. such as domestic work. Um, and uh, we also see mine workers who wear uh, blue overalls, um, who are also part of that working class. And uh, this color is also associated with um, the idea of loyalty. Um, so thinking about um, the servant's loyalty to their master. Um, and it carries its own history of migration um, into the introduction of um, usage as a pigment for textiles. Um, it was uh, actually developed by a German chemist from a plant that was harvested from India and Bangladesh um, and then migrated uh, throughout the world um, through um, the Dutch East India Company and the British um, East Company's trade routes. Um, and interactions uh, in South Africa. But also, I think it's so interesting to note that Africa, particularly West Africa, has the second oldest tradition after India in terms of indigo dyeing, as well as, let's say, stitch dyeing and various other processes. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's very interesting to me about the uniform being blue is that it's quite a striking blue. And yet, oftentimes, we are so able to move past people wearing these overalls because, in a way, subconsciously, we've absorbed information from our world that these bodies become insignificant. Whereas, as seen in the almost triumphant and surreal ways, uh, what's now Sophie's depicted, these individuals, particularly Black women, were matriarchs. You know, they were leaders in their own households, leaders in their communities, and often a pillar of strength and wisdom. Yes, and I I think in speaking about um, the representation of triumph, um, it's depicted through Sophie riding this giant uh, horse on its hind legs, um, which is a form um, that is used for um, memorials that are dedicated to army generals, uh, particularly of um, the colonial era. Um, And uh, we can see that uh, Sophie is going through a form of um, imagination of herself as um, a a, a victorious army general. Um, And I I think she uh, begins a a transition um, into a sense of political will um, and self-determination um, desires that she has. So this is a representation of a, a psychological journey 
into a, a person's um, consciousness to try and, and find their own liberation. Um, and we see this dress also transition from the blue into purple, uh, which is accentuated in later images we'll see. Like the next image that has been shown um, where... Actually, what I actually wanted to touch on um, just before we we move forward, I think you're both you both touch on 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 two things that got me thinking. The first one was Siseko when you spoke about the visibility of individuals that are often um, dressed in these uh, garments, and I also and I absolutely agree with you know Saki. We're talking about the labor class and its place within larger society. Um, and if you think back, you know, in, 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 in certain households, somebody or an individual like a maid is not often the person that is pushed forward as a representation of the household. You know, it is always the aspect of the household that's kept, you know, when you think of the maid's uh, quarters or the servant's quarters <laughs> in architecture when we're building our nice houses. Um, and so I just think it's interesting when you mentioned how often individuals that are not only in these in these garments, but also the individuals that you consider to be a part of the same class or labor class. So your waitrons and so forth and so on. You know, I often just think, are these individuals also seen? Um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you, Saki. In the first slide, you can definitely see this transition. And I somehow, you know, in thinking about this, um, I wonder how Sophie, this character, echoes that desire to transition out of the, the, the limited space, the associations of wearing these garments come in. Yes, um, I like how you spoke about um, the uh, invisibility of uh, people such as Sophie when we speak about um, liberation movements and histories. I think particularly in the narrative of apartheid's liberation movement, um, there is hypervisibility um, and dominance of the um, narrative about um, male heroism um, and, you know, the leaders of um, the struggle who become these uh, veterans and stalwarts um, that are vener venerated. Um, and I, I think Sophie uh, tries to uh, bring more uh, visibility to stories that are part of the everyday structure of a uh, life um, and people's uh, stories who are part of um, the ordinary uh, life of South Africa during the time and still continues today. But um, in terms of Siseko's um, a point about matriarch, I also think it's important to acknowledge that women also became uh, part of the uh, uh, structure in their households where they were matriarchs because of um, the conditions they were forced under living in households without um, their husbands who had to leave home to find work in the cities um, uh, from their rural um, homesteads. Um, so there's also this disintegration of um, a, a traditional and conventional uh, black family structure. Um, and it's important to recognize the impact of apartheid's brutalism wasn't only um, psychological and economic for black people, but it also led to a breakdown of family structures. Mm. And this is this is so interesting because then I start thinking about you know labor systems and why they existed in the first place because one you know we we touched on or we spoke about you know and we will talk on sorry we will be touching on aspects of the diaspora when looking at um some of the works of the other artists coming up but just quickly um when one thinks about 
the diaspora or migration, whether it is from a nationalist point of view or from a transnationalist point of view, you know, there are many reasons people migrate and it's always interesting. You you hear most stories is that people leave by choice to go to go look for better opportunities or to go search for work. But this becomes interesting when you when you look at the history, particularly South Africans history with regards to um, labor markets and labor structures and how they actually came into being. Um, and you'll find that a lot of families were sort of separated, uh, not even because, because a lot of people came from independent economies, no, before they had to go into, into um, labor markets. Yes, I think the um, movement of urbanization and uh, migration, uh, diasporic narratives, also coincides with the rise of uh, capitalism um, and uh, the capitalist labor market system, um, which is uh, based on uh, resource extraction and hierarchies um, that determine people's positions and status in societies. So um, in the midst of uh, South Africa's industrial um, uh, move, development, um, there was also a need to supply that um, industrialization with uh, people that would uh, contribute to its productivity. Um, and uh, I think that's when um, under apartheid regime um, and even in contemporary global capitalism, uh, black people were used as um, a form of cheap labor that could mm. feed to that capitalist labor system in different ways. But that's why, just like coming back to Siseko, but that's why Siseko, like what you said about being seen and not seen really, uh, it's kind of sticking with me because it's almost as if there was a, des you know, this desire to be seen, but not to be seen in the way that um, the country at that point in time was seeing black people. I mean, I I, I think about um, what is this piece? The if we could just have the the previous slide, um, the artwork you put a spell on me. That is also we still see the same we still see the same persona, um, Sophie. But this time Sophie is wearing a color that one might what might remind one of um, Zionist Baptist churches. And if we think about the history of that and the segue from um, how these spaces were actually started as, I like to think, as a means of resistance. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, what do you think? Honestly, I think in the same way that Sophie is sort of dreaming or imagining these new spaces is the same thing that in a way lots of people would consider in any particular market specifically of labor. Um, if I might simplify my thoughts around it, I just think that we all want to be seen in a way that respects our dignity, respects our abilities, and also to unto that gives allows us then the freedom in which to move a bit more flexibly in our world. And I think and I think that's also what in a way we all yearn for. And I think it's a universal message that we can't really ignore. But particularly in the context of black people in apartheid, mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't alive then, but the resistance of building spaces such as churches, the resistance of building spaces of community was because in those spaces you could be seen in your full humanity. Mm. Mm. Yes, um, and I think it's also about creating a sense of belonging and rootedness in times when there is precarious um, forms of and violent forms of displacement and dislocation through, for example, apartheid segregation policies and forced removals. Um, and uh, 
the era of um, of the Victorian era, which was roughly between 1835 or till 1901, was a period that was marked by a lot of anti-colonial resistance movements from the British Commonwealth. And um, they were often led by spiritual leaders, um, mm -hmm. such as um, Ignaz Lekhanyu, who founded the Zionist Christian Church of South Africa. Um, and so when Sophie is represented in the position of a, a, a church leader of um, the ZCC, um, she also tries to inhabit a space of a spiritual uh, resistance, um, mm -hmm. which I think is where you could inhabit the space of um, dignity that uh, Siseko is speaking about. Um, mm -hmm. I also think, lastly, in uh, the ways that the Purple um, Shall Govern series, um, where we saw Sophie dressed in um, this alien-like uh, design. Can you see that? Can we bring that up while you talk through it? Sorry to interrupt you. Yes, I just wanted to state that it's also marked by another form of resistance that occurred um, during apartheid when um, there would be protesters on the street who were uh, confronted by the police um, and they would be sprayed by a water cannons that contained purple dye. So when they uh, left um, the scene um, to escape arrest, um, they would still be able to be identified um, by the police. Um, uh, and and I, we see here that um, May Sophie is like a queen of a kingdom um, and the uh, alien followers uh, strip away these markers of her servitude, um, such as the apron and the head wrap. Um, and uh, instead, we see this color traditionally symbolize um, nobility, royalty, and power that I think Sophie's trying to inhabit. Yeah, I really like how it is these tentacles that appear, uh, also just quickly, these tentacles that appear to be coming from her or from her garment, uh, you know, are they of her? And if you look quite closely, you'll see that they appear to almost what appears to be an, uh, an umbilical cord that's, that's actually, as you're saying, disrobing these markers and these signifiers. Um, another artist that I know that we, we you know, just didn't, I know we, we spoke about the diaspora earlier, another artist that whose practice or whose work in some way or another touches on it is uh, Yinka Shonabari. Um, Saseko, do you want to, oh, Saki, sorry, do you want to, do you want to just? Yes, I, I want to respond on the notion of um, diaspora because I think it is found in um, Meris Bande and Yinka Shonuba, and it continues um, throughout the other artists in, in various ways. Um, for example, with Mary Sibande in that um, last installation, uh, in the midst of chaos, there's opportunity. Um, we see uh, these army soldier figures um, that are also um, feminized through the uh, design of their uniform with puffy shoulders, um, like the uh, ZCC church uniform. But uh, we know that certain uh, people, particularly black men, were not only removed from their homes for um, economic reasons to work in the cities, but they were, would also join the liberation struggle um, and have to go underground um, to uh, train as part of the armed uh, unit of the struggle, mm. such as mm. in mm. and 
um, that's mm -hmm. when they would uh, end up in neighboring countries such as Zimbabwe, for, for example, or Botswana, um, Zambia, Tanzania, and Kenya, where they would uh, find this um, community of uh, uh, soldiers who are ready to fight for uh, liberation. Mm -hmm. um, and with Yinka's case, uh, I think it uh, expands that uh, form of um, displacement and migration narratives into um, the transnational idea of diaspora. And I think it's important for us to uh, define the notion of diaspora and its origin. Um, it was originally related to the Jewish community um, since the third century BC um, and in the 20th century became a theoretical framework to also engage and study the migration practices um, of different communities from around the world who uh, might have been forcibly displaced through um, slavery um, or uh, in contemporary period um, for economic reasons, uh, which I think is part of uh, a the flow of global capitalism. Um, so in Yinka Shonibar's case, we see how um, we have to also think about uh, the specificity of diasporic communities that um, when we speak about diaspora, we should also ask whose diaspora we're speaking about in particular. Um, and I think with Nika Shunabar, his reference is related to the African diaspora um, and its entanglement with um, the British colonial system and its presence in um, England. Mm -hmm. I just think that question that you brought above displacement is so apt when we look at, I think it's the next image, Adam and Eve, because in a way we have this concept of, uh, the next one please, we have this concept, yeah, we have this concept of, let's say, Eden being this fixed place and in a way, I think, even just looking at the decapitated heads and the form and being dressed, there are so many idiosyncrasies, there are so many contradictions to that original story. And it leads me to a point where I remember this one time, Michael, you said something really profound about questioning how many stories on the continent had to be eliminated in order for this one to find root and proliferate all over. And I think that's also a, sig a significant point of departure for many people, especially from a spiritualistic point of view. But just looking at the Garden of Eden, it's in no fixed place. It exists with um, Adam and Eve dressed in this very Renaissance sort of way, Victorian sort of way. And it's related to, um, I think, the French Revolution, wherein uh, Marie Anton Antoinette was beheaded. I think of origin stories um, when mm. I when I when I look at this <laughs> when I look at this work, but also when I yeah when I look at this work in particular. And Saki, you said something that <laughs> I hope it didn't show up on my face that like sent me buzzing. You know when you when you spoke about um, establishing when we when we have a conversation around the diaspora, establishing whose uh, aspect or version of the story that we are talking about, because it also becomes quite easy to have sort of an, an, a simplistic conversation or, or it can be a word that can be used to be blanketing in terms of a people, mm -hmm. various people's uh, provenance. Um, but also what I think is interesting with this is the relationship between the provenance of the batik material that is featured in this work and what most people or what society associates it with. 
when thinking yeah. about diaspora, when even thinking about trade and. and yes, um, I think when we speak about diaspora, we need to recognize that it is based on the, that community's individuals or even cultural heritage objects um, that are, seek to sustain and maintain their connection to their homeland um, and also become spaces that are based on um, categories of difference um, to the host uh, country um, or the settler country. Um, and it's to disrupt the sense of a rooted identity of that settler country. It's also to um, be a space of resistance um, against a complete assimilation. And that is to say, um, integration that requires the erasure of your own culture into the settler um, nation's uh, form of, of culture. Um, so there's uh, a lot to be said in relation to contemporary African artists' own personal uh, migrations um, in a globalized world where um, quite often they might study in an art school that is um, outside of the continent or uh, establish their studio practice in a foreign country. And um, they, whenever they exhibited um, outside of their context um, of their so-called origins, um, there's the burden of representation they carry that they should represent the totality of their homeland's culture, which I think the artists like in Kushan and Bar try to constantly disrupt because they reveal the hybrid nature of um, histories that are um, represented by materials such as batik that you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. And the batik of fabrics history uh, is uh, actually uh, related to the uh, colonial trade routes um, that uh, uh, took this uh, technique of making um, this textile prints um, from Indonesia um, by the Dutch East India Company, where in the Netherlands it was um, mass produced um, and then uh, introduced into African cultures. Mm. So also a question about appropriation and reappropriation. Yeah, I, I was just thinking now, if, if you, you know, what takes, what, what takes precedent? Is it the people that took the practice the process or the technique and and commodified it and sold it to other people uh, because as much as we can you know we can name all the players involved in that whole production process at the end it's still of Indonesian descent right um, and I'm just I'm, I'm mentioning this because you spoke about you know the difficult well not but the challenging role of representations, particularly when it comes to um, contemporary African artists uh, who are of the diaspora. Yes, um, it's important to also note that um, Africa had its own forms of um, uh, wax dye techniques that um, are used um, for the batik fabric um, in its own way. And I know Siseko could speak to how, for example, um, the communities in Indonesia actually rejected the um, uh, Dutch uh, form of um, uh, manufacturing this fabric because it did not um, adhere to their standards. Um, and uh, when it comes to this fabric's representation of uh, um, African cultures, um, it's uh, 
part of an, uh, an, a journey to um, reclaim a lost heritage for um, generations that have been born and live in um, the diaspora communities and don't have a sense of um, access to knowledge about indigenous um, cultures to Africa. Um, and so there's a, a universalizing um, mechanism to this um, fabrics appropriation. Um, and I think yeah. we should also acknowledge that appropriation is also defined by, by ownership um, mm. and uh, economic power. Um, mm. I think uh, appropriation occurs unfairly when um, the uh, means of production and ownership um, of that specific cultural object um, is uh, not accessible to the people mm -hmm. of its um, origin. Um, mm -hmm. I think that by virtue of it existing within a capitalistic system, it, you know, it, it cuts off access to the people of its origin. Yeah, and also where it's produced. I mean, wax print is not produced on the continent. Mm. But I think there was something really interesting around the conversation of universality, let's say, for this. And it's, it's I think it's quite poignant to mention that, particularly from an African perspective, sometimes this fabric doesn't have much cultural significance. I mean, I grew up as a as cross individual and I always used to see them, but I just thought they were pretty fabrics. And in a way, what has happened, and if I might place it in the, in the conversation of appropriation, I think there's something different when an object, let's say, is taken or practices taken and introduced into a space that then takes it and shifts it and amalgamates it with a whole host of different meanings attached. So I think there's so much transformation that has happened to this particular textile that in a way there is that sense of a, a claiming from the African perspective, but more I argue from the diasporic context as you know, you see in all these films, you see in these series, African people yeah. wearing dashikis, they're yeah. wearing wax print, and that yeah. is the identity I that went, is fed yeah. out to the world. I, 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 just thinking about what you're saying makes me wonder, um, you know, when individuals from the, the continent where that cultural production is taken from, Yal appropriation to whoever is appropriating, you know, particularly from a when we look at it from an African perspective, you know, when when we here on the continent are shouting, um, I see that. <laughs> I, I saw that, Saki. I want to unpack that reaction. Um, when we here on the con when we need, we here on the continent are saying, "Hey, that's appropriating." When it comes to textiles and fabrics, right? And when black bodies that, let's say, for example, are based in the United States, are pointing at the same fabrics and saying, "Hey, that's appropriating," uh, the basis. You know, um, and I think that's the beauty of these, you know, of, of or at least for myself, I think in my uh, a lot of, you know, information and knowledge and education has come via these objects um, at museums such as ours, you know, although we are unpacking and, and having this conversation through these contemporary objects, one is still able to learn about a range of 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 information uh, i think we can also acknowledge that um, appropriation is problematic and complex in its nature but it also um, allows us to understand that um, traditions are invented and have the ability to adapt and evolve according to their 
conditions um, that uh, necessitate that uh, evolution. Um, and as much as uh, we can um, uh, speak about how uh, people in Africa um, often um, are used uh, to benefit particularly um, white monopoly capital um, in the diaspora, um, we can also acknowledge um, the, the origin of these cultural objects um, do not have a pure form of authenticity. Um, and um, this gives the contemporary artists the ability to um, uh, resist limitation on uh, the representation of their work. Um, that they don't have to be beholden to um, being representatives of, on behalf of a, a, an entire nation or cultural group, uh, because there is no pure origin um, for these uh, authentic, for these uh, materials. And it also uh, acknowledges the um, way that uh, there's no uh, sense of uh, pure British national identity that um, its uh, progress as a, um, a society uh, could not have occurred without the presence and contribution of African people. Um, and so both African and British um, national identities are intertwined um, and uh, have uh, impacted each other. Um, and so we have this hybrid subjectivity that many people live in that is between tradition and modernity um, and uh, history and the contemporary. If we move on to um, Nandipam Tambo, we'll see that uh, I think this speaks to what you're talking about, um, uh, Michael, uh, when we're talking about luxury um, within fashion. Um, for example, um, hood couture, which is like custom made, one of a kind garments from ateliers in, in Paris and Italy. But um, they are the centers that have the most uh, visibility, yet, um, what happens when we take a look at a, a notion of African luxury? Um, and uh, I think Nandipam Tambo plays with this idea um, beautifully, but through the use of cowhide. What do you think, Siseko, about these dresses? I, I mean, on my end, just them being suspended gives them this feeling of being out of reach you know, as if they exist on this separate plane. But also onto that, just the idea that you could mold your body to it or have it mold onto your body. And cowhide being particularly difficult and tough to work with, I think just how she's manipulated and transformed them, giving us these spectral visages is just, I think simply put, it tells story beyond the traditionally defined way in which we ought to view cowhide. Even when we look at the next image, it's um, Mbafto, which is a reference to an army. Um, we also see how cowhide can uh, also be an, a material like armor. Um, and uh, uh, even the idea of, um, um, as we spoke about earlier with uh, Mary Sibanda of the matriarchal lineage, um, and being a leader of um, a matriarchal kingdom, uh, we see here um, what type of army would exist in a matriarchal nation. Um, and, I, I, and I think it's rendered beautifully here through um, th th this installation. Michael, what do you think about um, Nandipam Tambo's work? A lot, <laughs> a lot. But I think the one thing that I, that, that I constantly come back to whenever I'm um, the, you know, listening about a practice or uh, looking at a work is memory. I, I 
I'm quite interested in exploring how, I mean, you look at these, these molds of these bodies and I, there's always this um, question I have, are these molds empty or are they full? You know, and then it, it also makes me think of memory. And I think that our bodies have such an interesting way of um, retaining memory or holding or creating or creating memory. And when you think of some of the abstract themes that she thinks about, you know, like these binaries of sort of uh, desire and uh, what is the other one? Sort of, you know, sort of like desire and repulsion. You think of, um, you know, man, man as animal and man as human. It's interesting to see how that plays out. And I think we all go through that somewhere or other, and we all express it through this um, somewhere or other. So. I, yeah, her work is amazing. And I mean, I'd, there's a larger conversation, I think, to be had around, around, um, that I'm curious to have around African leisure and, and you know, goods and, or production and what that looks like. Because often it is so culture and heritage, um, if you, if you think major brands. And I'm, I'm speaking about this here because it's also we're starting to like this fine line or this sort of blurred line between contemporary art or art and, and fashion. And there are some that even might say that fashion is a form of art. So, yeah. Yes, and I would completely agree. I think um, that's what Nandipam Tambo does, particularly with the first images we saw um, where um, she's uh, trying to um, disrupt, like I said earlier, the, the dominant visual language that is a part of institutions um, such as uh, museums, galleries, and um, art schools. Um, and to say that fashion uh, design is an art form, um, and uh, even further than that, that should it be an art form, um, a cowhide material um, is um, a material that has value um, um, in, in order to be part of um, that um, discourse. And I, I, I think when you also consider how- Sorry to interrupt you, Saki. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. You spoke about how cowhide can be introduced, uh, you know, as a part of the conversation when we think about luxury or African luxury. It's weird because for me, I always feel that it has been. You know, if you look at look at designer leather bags without name drop dropping um, certain <laughs> European brands that have been in existence. What mm -hmm. I find interesting is that when we speak about this particular material from an Amer Euro American perspective in terms of luxury, and when we speak about this material or cowhide from a continent a continental um, perspective, is it the same conversation? Are we describing the same? I don't think it's the same conversation because as much as cowhide has been, like you said, through leather goods, um, it's always been de-aestheticized. Um, it hasn't carried... What does that mean? Me. Sorry, what does that mean? It's always been part of um, this um, a neutralized uh, form of presentation that is removed from the animal that it's taken from. It's highly processed into um, uh, uh, marketable um, and um, uh, packaged in a way that can be used um, for advertising without um, a, a sense of where it comes from. And I think Nandipa takes it a step further by making a presentation with the fur, um, with the markers that, um, uh, give an indication of its source, um, and um, I mean, even going back to what you're talking, about, you were talking about earlier on um, the, um, uh, the identifies between human and uh, non-human. Um, I think to th when you think about um, cowhide with its fur as skin, um, that also um, plays within the realm of um, anthropology um, and the study of race and um, including 
uh, an acknowledgement that this material is difficult to work with. So when you're talking about skills of craftsmanship, um, I, I, which are often spoken about in relation to hood couture, that's why it's um, expensive because um, there is a, a, a countless hours of labor and an entire team of pattern designers and seamstresses. Um, a cow hide uh, with its fur uh, evident is also um, extremely difficult to work with. And um, it does require a great amount of craftsmanship um, or, or, or craft skill um, to, to um, able to manipulate it and into a specific form. Um, and, uh, and I think that's what Nandipa would like us to um, reveal in this conversation around luxury. What is the what are the value systems we ascribe to different types of materials, and what do they look like? And when we show what they look like from its source, what type of uh, people do we think about? Um, and I think the next uh, image actually disrupts that notion that we should think about Nguni cultures in Africa because she then uses cowhide um, as a form of snakeskin, um, which is related to uh, classical Greek mythology um, rather than uh, a, a traditional African uh, culture. Um, this is a, a, a kidna, uh, which is a, a, a mythological creature um, known as the mother of all monsters um, in the pantheon of Greek uh, deities and gods. Um, Echidna is responsible for the Sphinx, the Hydra, the uh, Cerebus, which is the three-headed dog that guards Hades underworld, um, the Chimera, which is half lion, half goat, half, uh, part lion, part goat, part serpent, um, <laughs> and the tetrahedid hydra. So um, I'm curious, Michael, about your uh, uh, response to the way that Nandipa has manipulated cowhide to look like snakeskin. Um, this, uh, this exhibition for me, um, what was the exhibition called? Uh, the Snake You Left Inside Me. I was quite pleased by now. I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot that has been said and explored in terms of uh, mythology, folklore, um, around serpentine, serpentine law. Uh, and it's interesting because I remember having a conversation about this work with myself in Silicon. Um, was a second to make another reference. Uh, but what I what I think of about this work, you know, we, we spoke about design, repulsion, and I think of every Black friend, aunt, grandparent, mother, father that has sat next to me and either a picture of a snake has come up on the television or on the phone and that response of repulsion <laughs> that takes yeah. place there. Um, and it's interesting to see how, you know, different cultures also revere the symbolism and the meaning and the meaning, meaning of a snake. But I, I think that it's amazing that she was able to take um, the skin I mean, hide of something and sort of manipulate it and work with it to create yes. another. Um, I'd like to hear from Siseko before we move on to the next but artist. Also before I we do move on, I, I just want to also say, guys, please feel free to share with us your thoughts if you have any questions regarding some of the artists that we are talking about. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yes, please write in our chat group. Um, I agree with you, Michael, that uh, there's this play between repulsion, and I think um, she also tries to bring the sense of maternal um, from the lethal, um, the idea that, um, you know, the snake under Christian theology is related to um, Satan and um, particularly in connection to women and that Eve is the seductress and temptress um, and uh, the a uh, snake is also a symbol of witchcraft. But when you look at, um, for example, um, uh, Kosa clans, um, such as um, Umatola, which is a specific snake that is um, uh, an embodiment of an ancestor, 
um, that should not be killed should it visit your home, um, you do find a sense of reverence for the snake. Um, and that in other cultures, like um, in, even in ancient Egypt, um, the snake, or you know, was a sign of eternal life, um, like the Euroboros um, symbol. What do you think about that, Sisefo? Before we speak about um, Leonce Raphael at Jebelu. No, I think you know, material cowhide into the snake-like skin. It almost exemplifies, in a way a breaking away of binaries, breaking away of, you know, separations or false dichotomies. In it, Nandipa shows that this material often associated with this very anthropologically traditional uh, referencing becomes something or becomes able to tell story. I mean, on my end, already just thinking of a big snake, I thought about Inca Nyamba that would arrive in thunder and storms and already these different intersections as the personal is infused within the work. Mm. Okay, so next we have Leonce Raphael Ekjebelu from Benin. Um, these are photographs that are currently part of our Two Together exhibition um, from um, our collection. Um, and what is your initial response to this work, Michael? Um, I. I was actually already thinking about it when I was looking at um, the, the previous work that we just saw now. Uh, a tra I think transformation, I think really transformation, I think that the spiritual practice of the Gungu um, has been around for years, has managed to sort of survive all these major shifts, you know, continental. Um, and I think that it's also interesting how spiritual practice can do that, can preserve, um, can preserve the histories of the people uh, through this, because this is also a practice that's based on, um, what do you call it, uh, clan, clan names. So the Gungun that, the, the, the individual that puts on the garment is standing in, um, is interceding on behalf of the clan. And that's what's taking place. So there's a question around kinship about the practice itself, but I also think that it's quite interesting how he used video photography to capture these figures um, outside. Yes, um, I think we need to give more context to the Egungun practice and uh, where it comes from. Um, it's actually, this type of masquerade is to, um, worship and honor um, Yoruba spiritual deities, but also ancestral figures like you man mentioned, um, Michael, around uh, the idea of kinship. But um, it, these type of practices are also found in um, South America and the Caribbean um, with, for example, Afro-Brazilian um, condomble um, masquerades. Um, and what's fascinating about Benin is um, within, in relation to religion is how um, syncretic it is, meaning that uh, a person could uh, be um, uh, a Muslim or Hindi or Christian, specifically Catholic, um, and um, even a voodoo priest or priestess um, practicing spiritism um, or um, animism, which is um, animal sacrifice for ancestral worship. Um, at the same time, many people um, have a, a fluid a transition between these religions at any given time, and it is socially accepted in Benin. And I think we find um, evidence of this in the textile of um, these photographs. Um, for example, here we see a sequence um, uh, with parts that reference the animal animals that would be used as a, a ritualistic sacrifice. Um, there's also sil silk fabrics, but also the um, cowrie shawl, um, which was actually the one of the only forms of possession that um, enslaved people from West Africa could take with them because they could hide in it in their hair. 
Um, uh, Siseke, could you please tell us more about County Shell? So Kari found along the shore and for some time they were actually form of currency, one of the first forms of currency, particularly during the Afro-Asian uh, trading period. I mean, due to their rarity in that they're in the sense of man, man labor or body la bodily labor to pick them up one by one, they were essentially rare at the time and now they are finding their way into the larger mainstream, perhaps in terms of jewelry and the like. But they've always also had this very uh, deep significant spiritual significance, and so too added, as you can see. Yes, um, Kari Shah, I think, is, has an extensive history in um, being a form of currency, uh, like Sisekro mentioned. Um, but I think. Uh, if you please go to the next image, um, we see uh, Lianza also use um, studio photography technique to capture the Egungun. Um, although they are immersed in nature, like they should be, they wouldn't be able to be presented within a studio because the wearers and makers of the Egungun um, uh, Armits would not allow that. Um, they have to exist in nature. Um, it's interesting how they, they are staged and posed together. Um, there's clearly a use of artificial lighting um, because of the you know, even degradation of the lighting. Um, and uh, there's um, also this reference to exotic backdrops, uh, these artificial backdrops that are also used in studio photography. And actually, Leonce has a school of photography that um, teaches the practice of um, outdoor photography, which uses um, studio photography technique. You um, even the first one? It was the, it was the, it's the first one that will open there. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and uh, once again, uh, Leonza could have chosen to show us the masquerade ritual in its performance, but he chooses to show it in this highly staged and constructed um, form um, in, through studio photography type um, pra technique. And I think he does that because um, like uh, Nandipa does with the cowhide uh, in relation to Guni culture, um, with Beninese culture, um, he's trying to um, take it away from um, an anthropological lens and for us to really look at um, the skill um, that is part of these garments who, which are uh, newly created each year and have become a historical record um, from uh, about the Beninese um, history um, and its uh, interactions with other cultures. We see here, for example, um, the design like a Pope's robes, including the papal hat. Um, and then we see the iconography on the sequence of uh, Chinese mythology uh, looking like a, a dragon. Um, and then the cowrie shells. And even that text um, uh, is Yoruba, um, meaning wealth and prosperity, because that is um, the symbolism of the cowrie. Uh, Michael, okay, I think it's also... Say, before Sorry? we move on to our last artist. No, I just wanted to find out what would you like to say before we move on to our last artist about Beyonce's work? Oh, no, just that uh, you were describing some of the things we've seen. I thought it was so <laughs> these, uh, call them these, what appear to be garden gloves, you know, these everyday contemporary objects and items that are also utilized to make ultimately make up the, um, the costume. Mm. And you know, the cowrie shawl had another name in um, Italian that was related to porcelain, basically. Um, even though the cowrie shawl is found predominantly in the Indian Ocean and parts of the Pacific Ocean from sea snail, um, whenever the, it washes ashore, it is uh, seen as a gift from the Orisha of the sea. And um, uh, yet, in the European context, you know, we find its connection to um, uh, porcelain. Um, so, so, so our last question. 
We have a question before you move on. Um, there's a question from uh, Kylie. What is the significance of masks in Beyonce's work? Um, I think Leonce, well, it's not necessarily related to Leonce's work because he also uh, does other types of photography of, for example, um, boxes. Um, but in relation to the Egungun masquerade ritual itself, it's basically a, a reference to the Yoruba cosmo cosmology that we were speaking about earlier. Um, and the wearers of the uh, costumes and masks are anonymous to the villagers. Um, and there's a, an apprenticeship um, uh, practice where um, a, a person would be identified, typically male. And I think that's interesting when we think about um, embroidery, sewing, threading, um, and, and uh, and it's actually typically males and they also don't only perform um, gendered deities. Um, these de deities could be male or female or neither. Um, and, and so it's not like they inhabit um, a specific gender. Um, and um, they created in advance over a year um, that's interesting because you also they, can't tell just looking at the, the garments, the, not the garments, but the, the costume, whether they are <laughs> masculine or feminine in nature. Yes. Um, but uh, to answer Carl's question specifically, you would have Sorry. to uh, uh, engage in Yoruba cosmology and see all the Arishas and deities. Um, there's a multitude, there's a, a larger spectrum than we have depicted um, in our presentation. Um, and as you mentioned, Michael, it's also related to ancestral worship and um, the lineage of one's clan. And I think this is where we should mention that the costumes became a historical record because of these uh, punitive uh, expeditions led by British invasion uh, and pillage of Benin. Benin was a large kingdom and civilization that was highly sophisticated and um, it, up to even past the 1500s during the medieval times in Europe known as the Dark Angel, uh, ages, um, Benin was still a thriving kingdom and it was engaged in trade of palm oil with um, uh, foreign nations um, and other uh, kingdoms. And I think we have to acknowledge um, the loss of the Benin bronzes, which are currently um, housed in the British Museum and other museums in Europe, but predominantly the British Museum the most. Um, uh, where they arrived there actually as a, uh, a way to uh, pay for the colonial invasion of Benin where they even assassinated the king known as an Oba. Um, so when you have, uh, these Benin bronzes were in gold, um, cast in gold and they were more definitive uh, sculptural busts um, of the ancestral lineage. So when you, we, you, you, ha you see this ability of adaptation and evolution that uh, African cultures have, uh, despite this um, attempt at historical erasure of their identity. Um, so our last artist is Sinzeni Maracela. Uh, Michael, would you like to, or Siseko, please, would you speak more about uh, Sinzeni? Um, if you could please have the next image so people can see an example of her work. These are blankets known as Ijali in Kosta, um, where she's uh, sw sewn um, red thread um, in the style of um, the topography or landscape you'd find in Johannesburg, um, you know, in reference to the slag heaps or those mountains of industrial waste material from decommissioned mines um, that we find surrounding townships. Um, and she actually wore these blankets as part of 
um, an outfit. Um, if you could please see the next uh, image. Yes, it would, be, it would have been presumably worn as part of this outfit, but due to the, the heaviness of the blanket, she decided to repurpose them. Um, Siseko, just please speak more about um, this image. Yeah, so since then he crossed this uh, persona, Theodora, and she's married to a man by the name of Gebane, and here in Theodora comes to Johannesburg, she arrives looking for Ukeban. And so I think in large part, she speaks of this notion of waiting, of this sense of waiting becoming a practice or a presence, uh, waiting. Then also a domestic worker. And so there's a lot of the personal, which in a way, a, a, a conversation of. You, you're breaking up there. Can you hey. hear me now? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Sorry about that. I don't know what's no, happening I'm today. Um, I just think for me, just looking at this particular scene where she's sitting on the sidewalk, um, it elicits um, uh, memories of when my mother and I would pick up my grandmother who was a domestic worker. And so it brings to mind the conversations of how way of life was particularly <clears throat> of, say, the men going off to the mines to work and then the women having to make a living. And so to going to Johannesburg to attempt to locate their husbands and also to make a living for them, so for their children at home. So I think there's a lot of history intrinsic, particularly through the lens of labor during the apartheid regime and also in some continuations today. So I think it is something that many might view as quite personal, but as a collective remembrance, I think we can all in some shape or form touch uh, memory or thought mm. around that. I like what you said about the waiting and not only from a historic sort of um, perspective, but if you think of a lot of mothers, who's, I, I think waiting on the other side, a lot of children, uh, well, well, a lot of mothers whose children have come down <laughs> to places or cities like Cape Town um, to study. Uh, people that have come, that have left their homes and said, even to this day, when we think of migration, people that, you know, they leave their, in some instances, cities, in some instances, countries, they drop it when they get here. Um, it doesn't always, you know, turn out. It's a curious um, journey that one makes. Mm. Uh, you know, the stress is actually a, a personal artifact um, speaking about memory for Sinzeni because it actually belonged to um, her mother um, who uh, due to issues around mental health um, because she was diagnosed with schizophrenia would often wander away from home um, and um, the, I think Sinzeni always wanted to to find the um, effect of apartheid's brutalism um, in the psychological. Um, what forms of um, uh, uh, journeys do uh, Black women embark upon when um, they're faced with um, the, the violence and trauma of um, apartheid? Um, for example, um, you see her sitting on the sidewalk of an affluent um, suburb, uh, which, you know, in, in the context of Johannesburg, uh, has a, a long history in um, the, the capitalistic exploitation of mining labor. Um, and it, it's this state of waiting for a husband who would never return, um, but also a state of contemplation of um, other women in her position, but even perhaps um, her own desires to still 
continue and live life um, and find ways of survival. And there's a, an agency um, in her, her journey to uh, travel to Johannesburg to find her husband. Um, and even in the other image with the mural, you know, it says most wanted look. Um, and we see even a, 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 a face in the lower uh, left hand part that looks back at um, Theodora. So there's also um, a desire to be visible because in many cases, uh, you know, Sinzeni's in embodiment of this uh, character, she's found that um, people either um, pay particular attention um, to assist her because of uh, the respect they, that is uh, given to um, the status of a Makoti um, or a wife, um, or she just becomes completely invisible uh, to men's advances. Um, you know, she said it was also a way of protection um, from uh, men's sexual advances because there was this virtuosity uh, around the Shreshra. And if you look at the last image, the next image, please, you'll see, you know, the Shreshra in the color red. Um, and uh, this references um, the red dust in um, the rural villages of the Eastern Cape. And when uh, uh, people would... Um, uh, be particularly men would be conscripted into war, like the First World War and the Second World War, um, or if they had to um, deal with um, anti-colonial resistance wars, um, they would uh, leave on horseback and um, the horses would kick this red dust into the air. Um, and um, it, we find a resonance later um, with men leaving to work in the mines in the red dust of those um, slag heaps um, and how they release toxic toxicity into the air of, of Johannesburg. So this color red, even like an ochre, uh, is highly symbolic. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, Shresha also has this transnational history um, where it was introduced by um, a French um, uh, uh, missionaries to King Umishweshwe the um, first, and uh, so it's also part of Basutu uh, culture, um, and um, it, it also speaks about how when color indigo was introduced into it, um, it which was the most popular color for Shweshwe before modernization, um, it was like a form of allegiance um, to, to these um, missionaries. Um, so how it becomes assimilated into the Kosa and Sutu cultural practices is another indication of um, the, the inventiveness and constructed for nature of our traditions and the way that they adapt and evolve over time. Well, thank you so much for that. So, okay, just to uh, wrap up, do we have any uh, questions or thoughts on some of the topics that we've been attacking? Okay. If not, then ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed the conversation with us. Uh, please do not log off. We'll be, there will be another um, conversation uh, taking place soon this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael and Siseko, for the conversation. I hope our audiences uh, felt they have learned a lot today. Um, and they will explore further some of the uh, topics and themes um, we spoke about this evening. Yeah, and I mean, I'm so, so thankful that somehow the bandwidth, despite the difficulties, managed to hold through. But also on that <laughs> end, just... 
also on that end, just to sort of bring together that sort of openness to what we wear and what it says about us. I mean, the very things we wear at times have these histories that we're not even aware of and of how they move and they shake and they form and they sort of like get pulled apart and put back together again. So I just think there's so much beauty in textile and how it's manipulated, particularly by these artists. 